Um, my name is Constance. I work in an adult store in Petaluma, California. Um, it's a combination of an adult shop and head shop. So I run into a lot of interesting characters, and I'd like to share some of them with you. Yay! Um, the collection is tentatively titled Poops. Um, so number three, Bird Bones Seeks Poop. He appeared fragile like his bones were cast from the thinnest glass. His skin was a transparent recall paper coating between the world and his blood vessels. He had bruises on his hands from brushing up against doorknobs. Brown and yellow specks of liver disease littered the exposed skin peeking out from under khaki sleeves of a windbreaker. He trembled, and with every movement, his fragile skeleton vibrated violently inside, threatening neither escape or collapse. He smiled at me with quaking lips, peeling back to reveal gray rectangles of teeth. You have movies here? He sputtered sheepishly. We do. They're along the back wall there, I said, pointing a finger across the store. Do you need coins? He said, burying his hands in his pockets. Uh, in the pockets of his jacket and flapping his folded khaki arms out like a newly hatched bird, jingling the change inside. He asked this, hands in his pockets, jerking about, painted, painting a very vivid portrait of him eating his ancient weathered meat somewhere in the store, <laughs> in my presence. <laughs> I blinked several times in rapid succession, allowing the question to fully process so that I might reply in a polite manner, or at least one less akin to revulsion. Urgency slipped from between my lips and I said, no, they're DVDs. You take them home and watch them. They're individually priced. <laughs> oh, he removed his hand from his jacket pocket where he'd been anxiously filling with quarters. Well, thank you. Goodbye. He turned slowly and shambled out the door. Number five, Bernie in the postman's pants. <laughs> He's been here before. He says and does all the same things each time. The only difference being this time I didn't recognize him. He had a yellow plastic grocery bag with him in the DVD room. I parted the shared hair curtain and asked him to please leave his bag at the counter. People steal shit. Porn. Shitty porn. <laughs> Shitty 80s porn. <laughs> they take the DVDs and leave the empty cases hanging on the wall. But I'm only going to be a minute, he said. He looked up at me confused. That's fine, I said with a smile. I just need you to leave your bag here. Oh, OK. He reached to the doorway and leaned around the corner to place the bag on the ground. The shift of air around him from that slight movement sent a waft of his scent right up my nose. Body odor and day-old booze. With my voice drowned out, the speaker blaring with tigre, I covered my nose and mouth. Maybe think about a shower too. I gagged. He walked around the blacklit room looking at the DVDs and audibly complained about how expensive they were. Eventually he made a selection and walked up to the counter. And you're beautiful. What is your name? <laughs> I smiled weakly, politely, and said, Constance, you're very beautiful. He said this to me many times. He's asked for my name many times. I am distracted by his odor. Constantly beautiful. <laughs> He's made this joke before. I smile, put his new copy of Asian Hose in a black plastic bag. And hand to me. Have a nice day, I say, fanning cheer. You too, beautiful. He said this as he blew a stale, booze scented kiss to me over the counter. My friend Jill walked through the door shortly after he left. Some weird old guy stopped me outside and told me I was beautiful. <laughs> Number one, the mailman. His Bob Ross white man's afro was puffed out all over his head like filthy <laughs> cotton candy that had been dropped on the floor of your local cinema, dug out of a dumpster out back, and fitted over his kind-looking yet untrustworthy face. It was a close-cropped, dense mass of fur, a bad winter cap somehow rooted deep into his cranium and sprouting from his face. He wore a turtleneck with a little 49ers logo neatly embroidered across the jugular. Never trust a man with a turtleneck, I thought. Tear that little logo off. Get in deep enough. Two birds, one stone. I wonder if he's even a legitimate mailman, just the holiday crew. Behind me in line, waiting for late morning coffee, he picked up two large bags of coffee beans from a shelf, where a sign clearly marked them for sale as $19.99. How much is this? He asked, a visibly, he asked a visibly busy barista. He waved the bag over the glass of the counter. She looked at the sign, then back at him, and forcing one of those gracious customer service smiles, she said, they're $19.99. He raised the other bag, and this one. She smiled lightly, $19.99. She said it discreetly enunciating each syllable. He mumbled some response. I'm not sure what, because I've already judged him as somebody who just liked to talk, make waves, and waste your time as well as his own. Maybe he was just waiting for this day to end like me. He had come into the shop a week before, all smiles and feigning friendly concern. He greeted me loudly with a hello as he opened the door, not even a foot in the building. I scrambled out of my cozy hiding spot in the dressing room and greeted him at the counter. 
I, he started to say, but I was higher than the devil, and I cut him off, rambling out on about how the package left at the tattoo shop next door. About the, <laughs> excuse me, about the package left for the tattoo shop next door, and how I would be sure to deliver it as soon as they arrived. He paused and stared vac vacantly for a beat before he said, no, I'm not the mailman. Well, I'm not this mailman, I'm not your mailman. And I instantly wondered what the hell he could possibly want from me if he's not the postman handling our mail. I'm the postal worker for the next block over. One of the other business owners at the alley here, he pointed behind him towards the door. A friendly, disapproving smile spread across his beard, bisecting it. They're a little upset. He looked at me evenly, waiting, trying to read through my all-purpose customer service smile. Excuse me. All-purpose customer service mask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they found the packaging from a vibrator in the alley around their dumpster. His voice goes all hushed when he says vibrator. I stared at him blankly. What does this have to do with me? I wondered. I just want to keep the peace here. He grinned and looked at me carefully. I apologized in the most feeble and hollow of ways, dripping with saccharin, something resembling politeness from a girl who really couldn't care less that someone could not wait until they got home to use or dispose of the packaging to their newly bad, their new, their new battery operated companion. Though I am the purveyor of such wares, what a customer chooses to do with these items once, once purchased is none of my affair. <laughs> he turns and starts towards the door, that bullshit smear, smile smeared all over his face, waving at me. I just thought I'd let you know, no need for hard feelings amongst neighbors. Six, it's fucking huge! <laughs> I couldn't help but wonder just how drunk he was when he crept into the store, eerily slow. He was staring at posters on the wall in the entryway, half-naked, airbrushed women peddling tacky, overpriced lingerie. Oblivious to me or the counter I stood behind, he meandered into the shop, ogling paper-printed women behind and partially consisting of plastic. I watched him for a moment and hoped he turned to face the rest of the store so that I could get a good look at what I was dealing at. He didn't. I smiled and called out cheerfully, hello. He turned lethargically, obviously surprised at my presence, but in no particular hurry. He shuffled, staggered up to the counter, his eyes shone glassy and thick. He pointed the left side of his face in my direction and looked at me through one eye. Potentially unaware of the volume of his own voice, he shouted, I need something to make my cock fucking huge! And he crisscrossed his hands over his groin. <laughs> <laughs> Baffled but determined to maintain composure in place of laughing directly at this man, I replied, Cosmetic surgery? <laughs> it's already pretty huge. Like seven, eight inches. He slurred and drooled, waiting for me to hustle across the sales floor to find just the perfect product or to marvel at his supposedly huge member. Neither of which I planned on doing. Well, good for you, I said. He stood in the same spot I greeted him. His marble eyes dart from me to the ceiling. I'm sorry. He paused. You don't deserve that. No, I said with my arms crossed, standing behind the counter, I'm grateful to have another customer in the back of the store. I don't. I waited for the reaction and anticipated bad one. I should probably walk away. Probably a good idea, I encouraged him. He swiveled on one foot to turn and leave, swayed slightly, and walked directly into a metal fixture that attached the security monitor to a post. Faced first with a loud metallic boom, the sound echoed through the cement basement location of the shop. This guido type on the other side of the sales floor looked up, holding a bottle of lubricant in his hand, his jaw on the floor. <laughs> the drunk didn't turn to see me doubled over laughing, laughing in silence and barely breathing. Instead, he shook off the impact and walked out the door. The Guido walks up to the counter. His open shirt showed off tufts of chest hair. The overhead fluorescent lighting caught a gold chain around his neck, resting the curls of dark hair. His bronzer was thick and greasy. He was friendly, timid, and was still holding the bottle when he approached the counter. I stood red-faced, gasping for air between giggles, laughter that I never bothered to hide even when the drunk was still in the store. I almost don't want to ask him questions to ask you after that. Guido said. Still laughing, I told him to go right ahead. It couldn't possibly be any worse than what just happened. He smiled sheepishly and agreed. I suppose you're right. I'm looking for lubricant for, well, one of those vagina and can things. <laughs> I was told cornstarch was ideal. <laughs> <laughs> Number 11. Damn it, Jim, I'm a dildo retailer, not a bartender. <laughs> he was told from the very, he was troubled from the very beginning. He asked too many questions, said things specifically said things you specifically aren't allowed to say in a place like this, like pot pipe. And uglier still, cheapest. While he searched for the remaining 68 cents so he didn't have to break a dollar, he launched into a diatribe about how he recently unloaded a girlfriend who had done nothing but cost him a fortune. A little more hostile with each sentence, his face <coughs> went mottled red, inhaling and exhaling sharply. He let the odor of cigarettes and their smokes 
escaped from his blackened chest cavity and hanging the air between us. He rambled on about how he was kind enough to give her $150 each month as play money, only to find out later she was completely spun out and kept several other boyfriends. She's what you'd call a speed whore, I guess. And as we're having it out, her pimp daddy, I guess is what you'd call him, is standing right there. And she doesn't understand why she doesn't get her allowance. <laughs> I gave the most benign responses in a still sympathetic tone, a kind of glorified sigh. I just can't help myself sometimes. He walked out the door, still raving, his hands violently striking the air in front of his well-worn face. Now that she's finally gone, I can actually afford to buy myself something. I had no idea. I thought she was an angel. The door slammed shut behind him, rattled the shelves, rattling the shelves of glass water pipes above my head.